November 23rd, 1940. Returning to our story where we left off at the end of part one, we had just begun to discuss the second German-Spanish meeting, which took place a month earlier, October 23rd, in Andai, France. At this seven-hour marathon meeting, the Spanish secretly agreed to join the war on the Axis side. However, this would only come at a date of its own choosing, and Germany still could not get Spain to make reasonable demands of Pétain's France, as far as post-war concessions. Although the meeting took place in France, the French didn't have any representatives there. However, the Germans had a feel for what Pétain and Laval would be willing to give up. Spain was eyeing large portions of France's colonial territories in North and West Africa. The negotiations were conducted at the highest possible level, and each side was represented by its respective head of state, German leader Adolf Hitler and Spanish leader the Generalissimo Francisco Franco. Now that we're all caught up, we can see how the Spanish took a wait-and-see approach and by November of 1942 still had not joined the Axis. Franco's Spain was involved in a lot of international trade with the United States, and the prospect of losing this Atlantic trade was too much of a threat to fully side with the Axis. America had by this point joined the Second World War, and the Americans were about to launch an invasion of North Africa, creating a second front there, which was intended to relieve the British in Libya and Egypt. Although both Spain and France were neutral, and Spain did have the trade relationship with America, Franco was seen as a fascist, and therefore a potential German ally, while Pétain was seen as a fascist and a German puppet. America thought that its diplomatic relations, which it had maintained with the French state, could potentially convince the French to stand down in the wake of an American landing. They also didn't necessarily trust the French or the Spanish, and while they tried to gain allies on the ground for once they had control, a military invasion of Morocco and Algeria was being planned by the Americans and the British, to be conducted under the banner of the American military. Given that France was still mostly occupied by the Germans and the government was seen as a puppet regime, America thought it a less risky option to violate French neutrality rather than Spanish, especially considering, again, that trade relationship with Spain. The Americans prepared for landings at Casablanca and two auxiliary sites on the Atlantic coast of French Morocco. As the Americans and British moved into position on the 7th, a pro-allied coup attempt sprang up in Rabat, undertaken by General Antoine Bethuar against the sitting resident general of French Morocco, Charles Nogue. However, loyal forces were summoned and the coup was crushed, with Morocco remaining firmly in the hands of the German-backed French state. The very next day, the American landings began. Under fire from French coastal batteries, the Americans were able to establish three beachheads, one at each of their designated landing points. The Alawite Sultan of Morocco, Mohammed V, a puppet of the French, was largely in opposition to the Axis, and although the French enacted some anti-Semitic policies under mandate from Germany, the Sultan refused to deport the relatively sizable Moroccan Jewish population, as Germany had ordered the French to do in their North African colonies. The Sultan also felt that this helped grant him a bit of legitimacy over Morocco's multi-ethnic population, and he felt it placed him in a better position as the leader of all of Morocco peoples, and he hoped it would one day grant him some sort of increased legitimacy over the Berber population that had never accepted Arab rule. But independence was a long way off, and right now there was a war on Morocco's territory as the German-backed French colony attempted to hold off the American invasion. A separate American force had been sent to Algeria, which included paratroopers, some of which drifted west of their intended targets and accidentally landed in Spanish Morocco, including an entire regiment. Dozens of American American paratroopers that landed in Spanish Morocco were returned for months. However, the Spanish kept them in very good shape, well fed, and released them in 1943, as Spain continued to enjoy cordial relations with America and seemed further than ever from joining the Axis. By the next day, the Americans had consolidated their holdings in Morocco and had taken the French Moroccan administrative capital, Rabat. Finally, by the 10th, the Americans had punched through the Taza Gap in northeast Morocco and reached the border with French Algeria. Algeria. The battle for Morocco was over. The Allies convinced the notorious German collaborator Admiral Darlan to surrender his administration of Algeria, along with that of neighboring French Morocco, to Allied operational forces. Even without the approval and, in fact, the explicit rejection of the largely German-backed government in Paris and Vichy, but was still easily possible to accomplish due to France's official neutrality. As for Charles de Gaulle's fighting French, who at present were turning French colonies in Equatorial Africa 
to the Allied side, were not yet involved in the Maghreb, and the French colonies which were allowing Allied operations were still officially subordinated to the regime that was backed by Germany. The Germans then punished Pétain for losing control of the colonies by occupying the entirety of France with garrisons and attempting to capture the French fleet at Toulon before the Allies could presumably turn it to their side as well. However, the French succeeded in scuttling the fleet before the Germans could capture it, creating even more bad blood between Germany and their French collaborators. With the Allies now setting up bases in Morocco, the situation took a turn on December 24th when Darlan, who had made himself many enemies, was assassinated in Algiers by a monarchist. Although he didn't technically run French Morocco, Darlan was effectively the master of French North Africa, and the Allies, who had attempted to collaborate with General Henri Giraud previous to the invasion until Giraud found out he didn't have much local support from the French, now set Giraud up as the leader of the French North African colony that were allowing Allied operations. Both Giraud and de Gaulle would attend the Casablanca Conference, which took place on January 14, 1942, and was led by Roosevelt and Churchill. Giraud and de Gaulle acted as joint representatives on behalf of the French, as they both effectively led rival governments, both allowing Allied operations on their colonial territory. However, Giraud's official loyalty still lay with the regime that was occupied by Germany back in Europe, although, again, its official neutrality allowed the situation to continue. Finally, on June 3rd, the situation was cleared up once and for all as Fighting France, the nickname of de Gaulle's provisional government, merged with the administrations of the French colonies in Africa still loyal to Paris to form the French National Liberation Committee, which brought all Allied-aligned French colonies under one provisional government in opposition to the Paris-slash-Vichy regime, the nickname Free France, which had applied to de Gaulle's original provisional government a few years earlier was still the common term for both fighting France and this new liberated French government, as the administration of all French colonies that were fighting alongside the Allies now came under de Gaulle, with Giraud a more senior army official than de Gaulle as his main military man. However, exactly one year to the day later, this provisional French government was replaced by an official republic headed by de Gaulle as the Free French prepared for the Normandy campaign and to reassume control over mainland France. This they finally did by the end of August, by which time the German-backed government had been eliminated and Pétain had fled to Germany. The Spanish now saw the writing on the wall, and far from joining the about-to-lose-access forces, they now officially abandoned their expansionist plans in Northwest Africa out of Allied-induced deference to de Gaulle's new France and its colonies. The following year, the Spanish agreed to give up Tangier, and they re-established the International Zone with the Rotating Council of International Representatives in the city-state. The following July, Franco merged the administrations of the Spanish Sahara and Spain's southern Moroccan protectorate known as Cape Juby or Tarfaya into a single colonial entity, similar to French West Africa, with a combined entity now becoming known as Spanish West Africa. With the European powers reasserting their presence in Morocco following the Second World War, an extraordinary series of events occurred in April 1947, led by Mohammed V, the puppet Arab Alawite Sultan, who officially represented the native populations of French Morocco, Spanish Morocco, and Cape Juby. He interpreted the creation of Spanish West Africa as a violation of his sovereignty over Cape Juby, and a demonstration was planned to assert the desire of the Moroccan population for independence from both the French and Spanish. To accomplish this, Mohammed was going to lead a march out of Rabat through French Morocco into Spanish Morocco and then ending up in the international city-state of Tangier, which by the way was another place that the Sultan officially held reign. And so in theory, he was asserting his sovereignty over these places, who largely relied on the Sultan for their legitimacy, which provided an incentive for them to let the Sultan through, but not before the French Special Forces and Intelligence Services could attempt to derail the event. The night before the march was supposed to take place, French Senegalese gendarme units, armed and sent into Moroccan working-class neighborhoods, killed at random approximately 180 Moroccan civilians, firing randomly into homes and resulting in innocent deaths, for which the Sultan would need to go to Casablanca to be present with those affected by the shootings. This cynical attempt to cancel the Tangier speech didn't work, as after spending two days in Casablanca, the Sultan set out on the postponed march to Tangier on April 9th. 
The next day, the Sultan arrived in Tangier and delivered the momentous Tangier speech. The Sultan proclaimed his authority under God over the people of Morocco, including all four claimed entities, and went on to present a vision of a future independent Morocco and how it might operate. The Sultan, without mentioning the French or Spanish once, had effectively laid out a roadmap to independence. The French Governor General had also given him a pro-French statement to read in the speech, which he declined to. Meanwhile, the Sultan's daughter was also present, and she gave speeches encouraging the promises of a free and independent Morocco, which would respect the rights of all its people. However, the French simply ignored this speech as best they could and continued supporting Muhammad. The Americans also began constructing military bases in French Morocco at this point, and by 1952, five American Air Force bases were present in French Morocco. On November 23rd of that year, Spanish Ifni was merged into Spanish West Africa, with the city now becoming an exclave of the larger Saharan entity, which would now be subordinated to Spanish Morocco, whose high commissioner would move to Ifni. Meanwhile, after the December 5th killing of Tunisian labor leader Farhad Hashid by French colonial paramilitaries, rioting broke out all across French colonies in Africa, and in Morocco, the independentist party, the Istiklal Party, along with allied communists, began to organize mass gatherings and foment revolution. The French responded by having the Sultan ban the parties on December 11th. The communist element was especially worrying for the Americans, who again had a large military presence in French Morocco. Although the Sultan did ban these parties, his anti-communist credentials and his friendship to the French and Americans was put into question, especially given his past activities such as the Tangier speech. Despite Muhammad's own hesitation, the French were uncompromising in their repression of the riots, also refusing to consider any internal reforms whatsoever, besides the fact that they no longer trusted the Sultan and to maintain control of the population. The French and Americans looked to bring greater stability to French Morocco, something that the French realized would require a more pliant and submissive sultan. Another reason for the American involvement was the fact that the Soviets had recently stated in the United Nations that the Americans were the, quote, principal aggressor in Morocco. They stepped up covert support for the Arab rebels and also the Berber army of Moroccan liberation, both of which were also brutally repressed by the Sultan and the French. However, the French's faith in the Sultan to keep the country together had been waning rapidly, and as he struggled to maintain power, the French finally launched a coup against Mohammed V on August 20th, 1953. The Spanish, however, did not support the coup, and although the French forced Mohammed V into exile in Corsica, the Spanish continued to recognize his rule over the native population within Spanish Morocco, ironically where much of his native opposition was located. However, the new sultan, Mohammed V's cousin Mohammed ben Arafa, was extremely unpopular viewed as illegitimate by the Moroccan population, including amongst the ruling Arab elites, and within a month he had faced an assassination attempt. Under the new sultan, violence only increased, as those unhappy with the new sultan now supported communists and the Istiklal in increasing numbers. On January 31st of the next year, six of the nationalists were exiled from Morocco. Around the same time, the French, taking extra precautions, moved the ex-sultan Mohammed V from his exile in Corsica to French Madagascar. However, the situation continued to deteriorate under Ben Arafa. This also meant increased violence against the French regime and in turn a loss of confidence by the French in their new puppet. The most reliable man in the country was the Grand Vizier, Mohamed al mokri who at age 104 had seen the history of Morocco since before the point we started covering from in part one of this series. He'd been on the native side of the administration for most of the existence of French Morocco and he was the man the French turned to to negotiate and find an acceptable settlement for all parties that would guarantee French control at least in the immediate future. Step one came on October 1st as Mohammed Ben Arafa abdicated, fleeing to the international city-state of Tangier. While well, just over a month later, Mohammed V returned from his exile in Madagascar and in a move that essentially admitted the failure of the coup a couple of years earlier, the Accords of La Selle Saint Cloud were signed. Mohammed V returned to the Moroccan throne, this time under negotiated conditions, thanks to Mohammed El Mokri, which included self-autonomy for French Morocco beginning February 15th of the next year. 
The once and present sultan began to reorganize the Moroccan state. He'd essentially been a feudal monarch over the tribal leaders and their conduit to the French administration of the entity. But now, to increase the sultan's legitimacy and to dispel international fears of a communist uprising in the country should it become independent, a parliamentary democracy was formed, which Muhammad V hoped would be acceptable to all tribal and ethnic parties. The Americans had confidence in this plan, and they now backed the idea of an independent Morocco, who they believed would be able to protect their military bases and not bow to communist insurgency or pressure. The French, already now embroiled in a war in neighboring French Algeria, did not want violence to spread in North Africa, and so they reluctantly went along as well. On March 2nd, the French-Moroccan Agreement was signed in Paris. The agreement was put into effect just over a month later, when on April 7, 1956, French Morocco was granted its independence. The French giving up the Treaty of Fez from 1912 also meant that the Spanish effectively had to give up their treaty regarding Morocco with the French. On the same day that French Morocco became independent, the Spanish-Moroccan Agreement was signed. Spain would set Spanish Morocco free, but would hold on to Ceuta and Malaysia, while also claiming that the Cape Juby Strip, just south of the now independent Morocco, was now part of Spanish West Africa and no longer constituted a part of Spanish Morocco. Morocco, realizing it could take care of these grievances later, accepted these conditions. And on the same day, April 7, 1956, Spanish Morocco became independent after 44 years of colonial rule. Although this is the end of Spanish Morocco, it is not the end of the story, as Spanish West Africa and other Spanish possessions continued to exist around Morocco, and Spain's policies in the region would continue to shape Morocco's future for decades to come. On August 1st, the new Moroccan state signed an agreement with America. Just as expected, Morocco provided the promised security for America's air bases, and in return, America agreed to end extrajudicial control of its citizens in Morocco's territory, and also agreed to the establishment of a military partnership with the Moroccan government. On October 29th, the international zone of Tangier reacceded into the sovereign sultanate of Morocco, ending the international council and control of the city. Mohammed Ben Arafa, who had of course been hiding in the city ever since his deposition from the Moroccan throne, was now now forced to flee Morocco, where he was banned and would have been executed, and the French helped their former client stay safe in the city of Nice. On the same day that Tangier returned to Morocco, Muhammad V changed the title of Sultan to King to symbolically end the era of colonialism, despite the fact that the Sultan title predated the colonial era. The Sultan of Morocco became the Kingdom of Morocco on October 29th, although that idealized parliamentary democracy quickly devolved into effectively absolute rule within a few years. Now, King Muhammad did not consider all of Morocco's territory to have been liberated, and as such, Morocco began to encourage agitations against Spanish control of areas such as Ifni. Dozens of pro-Spanish were killed in riots the next April. Morocco was subtly, but not too subtly, attempting to dismantle Spanish control in North and West Africa. Franco sent the Spanish Foreign Legion to El Ayoun, the capital of Spanish West Africa, in response, Morocco had mobilized its own armed forces. By October, an army of 1,500 combined regulars and irregulars raided border villages surrounding Ifni, which now was preparing for the outbreak of war. Spanish intelligence reports on November 21st confirmed that the Moroccans were not bluffing. Two days later, the Ifni War began. The Moroccans cut Spanish communications, and a combined 2,000 regulars and irregulars invaded Sidi Ifni against a Spanish force of combined locals and regulars as well. Within a week, Morocco had captured all of the villages surrounding Sidi Ifni itself that had been part of the Spanish territory, but had now been seized by Morocco. Around the city itself, the Spanish dug in, Lines of opposing trenches were dug in a semicircle around the city, as Franco continued to pour in troops to bolster the enclave. By December 8th, with the bulk of both sides' forces surrounding Ifni, the siege devolved into a stalemate. Sensing the Spanish vulnerability in the Sahara, Morocco launched an offensive into Spanish West Africa, over which Muhammad V had multiple claims. He claimed the northern Cape Juby part as a territory that he claimed Spain should have given back in 1956, while also claiming Saguia Alhamra and Rio de Oro as provinces of pre-colonial Morocco. The Spanish defenses were light and Morocco immediately experienced success. 
Morocco captured large portions of the desert in the eastern part of Seguia Alhambra, while Spain clung on to the cities and coastal regions. In January of the next year, Morocco reorganized its force in Spanish West Africa as it intended to take the more interior portions of Rio de Oro, now incorporating Saharawi rebels into the mix and arming them, with the native Army of the Sahara being a separate force from the Moroccan regular army. The Saharawis fought with the tenacity of a group attempting to achieve its independence, and they seized large chunks of territory in the mountains and deserts of eastern Rio de Oro. With the Ifni War raging, Spain was coming under increased international pressure regarding its colonialism, particularly when it comes to West Africa. Franco wanted to cast further legitimacy on the operations that would be needed to recapture the lost territory, trying to reframe what was largely labeled a colonial war into police actions, that by countering these terrorist insurgents, Spain was protecting its own citizens. To do this, Franco upgraded the status of natives of Rio de Oro and Seguia Alhambra, changing them from subjects of the Spanish state to citizens, with the former Spanish Sahara now reconstituted, but this time as a province of the Spanish state. Thus now, Spain could cast the war in the same light as if it was an invasion of the Canary Islands, or at least this was the intent of the Franco regime. A couple of days later, the capital of the new province of the Sahara was under attack. El Ayun was under assault from the north by mainly Moroccan regular forces. However, the Spanish held out firm. They redirected the Moroccan advance east of the city to the town of Edshura, where the next night, a Moroccan ambush took place on Spanish foreign legionnaires. A shootout and a battle ensued between them. Both sides would suffer heavy casualties, but the Spanish brought in reinforcements and the Moroccans were pushed back. The next day, in another structural move designed to increase international support for the war, Franco upgraded the last piece of Spanish West Africa, Sidi Ifni, which was still under siege from the Moroccans, and still ferociously defended by Spanish forces manning the trenches, was now also upgraded to a full province of the Spanish state proper. Within three weeks, the Spanish had reconquered much territory. However, the native Moroccan army of Saharan liberation on their flank was something that couldn't be dealt with necessarily by the Spanish regulars who were fighting the Moroccans up north. So on February 7th, France joined the war, committing 5,000 troops to the conflict to start. The French, striking mainly from French West Africa, combined with the Spanish to build a force of over 14,000 infantry and 150 aircraft. The Spanish army also kept advancing to the north, capturing Tarfaya, while in the south, the Spanish and French prepared for a combined assault on the Moroccan Army of Liberation of the Sahara. The Spanish advanced from Villa Cisneros, moving east, while the French moved west from their outpost, Fort Giro. By February 24th, the entirety of Rio de Oro was back in Spanish hands. Now, the remaining Army of Liberation fighters, along with the Moroccan regulars, were still attacking Sidi Ifni. The creation of the Army of Liberation had been partially instigated by Abdel Krim, ex-leader of the former Rif Republic during the war with Spain. He had been released from exile in French Réunion and was now living in Egypt. He had declined an invitation from the Alawi Sultan to return to Morocco, saying he wouldn't return until the French were were gone. But even now that they were gone, he did not cease to work against the interests of the Alawite sultans, including his encouragement from Egypt of a new Rifian uprising in 1958, which Moroccan forces quickly put down. Despite this, from Egypt he also helped to set up the leadership of the Moroccan Army of Liberation, fighting mostly in tandem with the Moroccans against the Spanish. As both sides continued to be dug in and the siege continued, negotiations opened up and on April 1st, the Treaty of Angra de Sintra was signed. While the fighting in Ifni continued, this treaty at least put a wrap on the Sahara portion of the conflict and Spain officially ceded their Cape Juby Protectorate, which the Spanish may have seen as inevitable given the fact that it was not included in the new Spanish Sahara, to the Moroccan crown. Present in Tarfaya on April 10th for the handover ceremony was the crown prince Hassan Du, who three years later would become king and would serve in that role for nearly 40 years, becoming the iron-fisted face of Morocco during the second half of the 20th century. However, the siege of Ifni continued with the Moroccans and their native allies making one more push to dislodge the Spanish. 
However, after two more months of losses and relatively little progress, the Moroccan Army of Liberation, without involvement from the Moroccan state, but likely at their direction, declared a ceasefire. This action finally brought the Ifni War to an end on June 30th, 1958. And while trouble was raging for the French in Algeria and in French West Africa, Morocco and the Sahara experienced a relatively peaceful next decade. By 1969, most of the surrounding countries were independent. Morocco was still agitating for possession of the Sahara, however, as was the recently recreated Mauritania. Meanwhile, in Ifni, the front lines of the Ifni War basically became the new borders of the entity. However, Spain made a concession to Morocco, not ceding any part of the Sahara, but now deciding to cede back the long-held Ifni territory, one of Spain's oldest in the area, back to Morocco. This it did on January 4th of 1969, but the Moroccan kingdom wasn't satisfied, and just over a year later, leaders of the previously secret organization Harakat Tahrir called a demonstration in Zemla in El Ayun to read out a petition of goals to the Spanish Governor General of the Sahara. This happened on June 17, 1970 and started out peaceful. However, eventually the demonstration was broken up by the Spanish gendarme and on the orders of the Governor General, police moved in to arrest the secret organization's leaders. The rioters responded by throwing stones back at the gendarme and police. However, the Spanish Foreign Legion was called in to suppress the uprising and began to fire back into the crowd, killing 11 civilians in what is known as the Zemla Uprising. This was the end of Harakat Tahrir as the main Sahrawi independence movement, and although for the moment it pacified Spanish Sahara, it set a precedent that the future of the entity would likely be decided by violent means. Following the incident itself, the leader of Harakat Tahrir, Mohammed Basiri, was on the run, but the Spanish gendarme would eventually hunt him down, and after being arrested, Basiri would disappear from his jail sentence. Supposedly, he had been executed by foreign legionnaires outside El Ayun, but nobody will really ever know, as after being arrested on June 18th, he was never seen again. However, again, despite the temporary peace, Sahrawi agitation would now take on a more military character. On May 10th, 1973, the Polisario was founded at two sites in Mauritania, the former French mining outpost of Zuera and the border post of Ain Bentili. Polisario was not just a military organization, it was not secret, and its goals were open. Indeed, the name was a contraction of the Spanish phrase Popular Front of the Liberation for Seguia Alhamra and Rio de Oro. It was founded by El Wali Mustafa Said, who also led the provisional government, at this point still a government in exile. However, he was not above taking part in military actions himself, and indeed he led the first Polisario raid into Spanish Sahara on May 20th, 1973, when, according to the Polisario, they attacked the Spanish encampment at El Hanga in the eastern deserts of Seguia Alhamra, bringing back a cache of Spanish weapons and equipment. With these weapons and equipment, the Polisario later seized the base and established a foothold in their nominal homeland with the intent of launching a war of liberation. One of the key reasons that the Saharawis were able to win at Al Khanga was the fact that the Spanish employed so-called nomad troops, many of whom were Saharawis themselves and the Polisario reported that numerous nomad troop units defected, not only in just the Al Conga raid, but in the weeks and months that followed. The Polisario had a socialist leaning, and the Soviet clients in Algeria were their main backers in the immediate area, with most of their arms coming from captured Spanish or Moroccan caches, with select weapons, fighters, and advisors coming from Cuba and Libya, still in limited numbers at this point. The Saharawis looked to reduce their reliance on smuggling through the French-aligned Mauritania, and by the next spring, the Polisario was able to expand and open up a border with direct access to Algeria. On May 12th, the United Nations fact-finding mission began as representatives arrived in El Ayun. After spending a week in the Sahara, the United Nations found that the Polisario's proxies in Spanish Sahara, which had spread their influence to most of the native population, were the most accepted political body by Sahrawi locals throughout the Spanish Sahara, including in the coastal cities. 
However, each side took away from this UN decision exactly what it wanted. Mauritania thought the decision granted it the rights to the Sahara. Morocco thought that it granted it the rights to the Sahara, while the Spanish thought the decision meant they had to do nothing. The Moroccans, with American support, as remember they did not want a Soviet client ultimately taking power in Western Sahara, launched the Green March, a peaceful civilian march protected by the military into Northern Spanish Sahara. Hundreds of thousands of Moroccan civilians gathered, and on November 5th, the military crossed the border. Following this, one of the most extraordinary sights of the 20th century, as thousands of civilians streamed across into the Spanish Sahara, flanking the military spearhead. The bemused Spanish forces were ordered to stand down and allow the peaceful protest and demonstration to occur. The Spanish now saw the writing on the wall and they began to evacuate settlers as they negotiated the future of the territory. Settlers began leaving from La Guerra at the southern tip of Rio de Oro while it came under Polisario attacks. The Spanish, having fully evacuated over the night of the 6th, abandoned the city, and the Polisario took it over on November 7th, reaching the sea for the first time in the war. Meanwhile, Spain was attempting to extract itself from the issue without allowing the Polisario to become the representative in Western Sahara, again largely due to its Soviet-aligned influence. On November 14th, Spain signed the Madrid Accords, this ignored the UN decision, recommending the handover of the territory to the Saharawis, and instead provided for its partition between Morocco and Mauritania, a pair of more reliable anti-communist states. Inevitably, this would prove trouble. However, as the conflict was beginning to rage, Spain lost its head of state for the past 40 years, as the Spanish state now officially announced the highly speculated news that Generalissimo Francisco Franco is dead. Meanwhile, back in the Sahara, the Mauritanians were attempting to begin the enforcement of the Madrid Accords. They advanced on the Polisario forces in La Guerra and other portions of southern Rio de Oro. Meanwhile, the Spanish, after Franco's death, rapidly continued the withdrawal, removing their troops from all but the coastal strip where the cities were located. In the power vacuum, the Polisario took control. However, the Moroccans were now beginning to claim their part in the Madrid Accords, and Royal Moroccan forces advanced from the north, with Mauritania still coming up from the south. By December 10th into the 11th, the Moroccans had reached the outskirts of El Ayoun. However, the Spanish were dug in as their evacuation continued, and the Moroccans' immediate plans shifted to the easier path of resistance provided by the Polisario, which had no air support, and the only armor they had was seized from opponents. As the Moroccans began rapidly advancing into Seguia Alhamra, the stories about what happened when Morocco captured an area forced the Saharawis to flee. Although it's unclear how much of this was real and how much was propaganda, the frontline action was certainly brutal, and Morocco certainly didn't allow any dissidents, but Soviet-aligned propaganda coming from Algeria into the Polisario convinced the civilians it was life or death. This inevitably created a scenario in which it was life or death, because the hundreds of thousands of refugees now streaming into Algeria were guarded by Algerian and Polisario forces, therefore having the byproduct of catching civilians in the crossfire of war. One such example was at Amgala, an oasis that was being used as a transit point for refugees by the Algerians and Polisario forces. On the night of January 27, 1976, the Moroccans launched a surprise attack. As the refugees fled to the east, both armies contested the numbers of captured and killed. However, at the end of the day, Morocco captured the oasis, nearly severing in two the Sahari evacuation effort and their burgeoning state. However, on February 3rd, Morocco said that it would submit to arbitration by the Arab League, and the UN appointed a mediator to oversee the issue. Despite that, Morocco is still continuing its military advance, as it believed it was entitled to via the Madrid Accords. The oasis of al Mabes, not far from the Algerian border, was a critical juncture on the supply route for the Polisario and their refugees, which the Moroccans captured on February 12th. Although the Polisario was able to maintain an ever so thin supply line to Algeria. A couple of days later, however, the Polisario struck back as the Second Battle of Amgala went to the Saharawis. This reopened up the supply routes and refugee routes and made it ever more critical that the Polisario maintain that corridor to Algeria in the east. However, in response to the defeat, 
Morocco began bombing the Sahrawi refugee camps with the excuse that the Polisario in Algeria were guarding them, thus completing the circle created by the initial fears and exodus of the population, with the bombing now serving to confirm what had previously been just a rumor. Meanwhile, Spain finally evacuated from most of the coastal cities, but as the Polisario filled the void, they were still forced to cede ground in the north and south to Morocco and Mauritania. The last remaining Spanish outpost in the Sahara was at Vigas Cisneros, which Spain officially evacuated, ceding the city to the Mauritanians on February 26th, with the Polisario filling the vacuum in rural areas. The next day, the Polisario's provisional government officially declared its permanent state. The Saharawi Arab Democratic Republic was proclaimed February 27, 1976, with its claimed capital at El Ayoun, or Layoun, which was now under Morocco's control, and thus the temporary capital was named as Bir Lalou. Despite the fact that the Saharawis controlled a lot of their claimed territory, their women, children, and elders had to keep evacuating into Algeria because of the fact that the Saharawis didn't have any air force, no other state was willing to provide air cover for them, and thus civilian centers in the Sahrawi Republic were bombed relentlessly by Morocco. While Mauritania was now closing in on exercising full control of its lower third of the country that it had been promised. However, the Sahrawis fought back, using guerrilla tactics to cross the border into Mauritania and launch raids, one of which included the president, El Wali Mustafa Said, who as I mentioned earlier was not afraid to take part in frontline action himself. This raid was on the Mauritanian capital, where the Saharawis attacked the presidential palace of Mauritania, but on their way back, El Wali was killed after his raiding party was ambushed by Mauritanian forces. Although this showed the downsides of the arrangement in terms of stability, it showed the desperate and unified nature of the Saharawis' struggle. But geopolitics is geopolitics, and Morocco and Mauritania pulled all the strings in the area, despite Algeria's support. The Saharawis simply didn't have the technology to defend their territory, and over the next year plus, Morocco and Mauritania closed in on the Saharawis from both the north and south. The Saharawi raids, however, continued as they were well practiced at guerrilla warfare, a tactic that fit well the situation that now existed. One Saharawi raid into Zoera captured French technicians working on behalf of the French for Mauritanian mining interests. Although the hostages were later released, France decided to get involved in the Western Sahara War. The French, with military garrisons in Mauritania, sent their air force to drop chemical weapons such as napalm on raiders attempting to break into Mauritania. However, even with French support, Mauritanian President Mokhtar ul Dada was decisively losing the war, not only losing face over Polisario raids, but also directly losing territory to the Saharawis. As such, on July 10th, a military coup was launched against the president, Despite the exasperation of the French, the new junta signed a ceasefire with the Saharawis. Mauritania agreed to evacuate its forces from Dakhla and the Sahara, returning these territories to the Saharawis, and the next August signing a peace treaty formally recognizing its borders with the Sahara and pulling fully out of the Western Sahara War. I mentioned at the beginning of part one that we'd briefly explain how the Saharawi borders got into such a weird shape. Well, that is half the border right there, as the Saharawis agreed not to extend their power further into Mauritania in return for Mauritania giving up all claims on Dakla and Laguera, the latter of which was ruined by the fighting anyway. On January 24th of the next year, America agreed to sell arms to Morocco, as again Libya was now supplying most of the weapons to the Saharawis. Although their lack of an air force was still by far their biggest weakness, and the evacuation of thousands of refugees from the Sahara into Algeria continued. However, the Carter administration had been at first reluctant to sell any weapons to Morocco, only eventually agreeing to sell them with the prospect that Morocco would be going to the peace table and using the weapons as leverage. And because of this, the Carter administration forced Morocco to take a hands-off approach when it came to the Sahara around this time, with the Saharawis advancing to the north. However, despite now being supplied by the Americans, the Moroccans had lost all of their momentum and were now on the back foot. As the front lines reached Guelta Zemur, a desert oasis in northeastern Rio de Oro, the Battle of Guelta Zemur broke out in early October. The battle was a definitive Saharawi victory, mainly thanks to the new surface-to-air missiles that the Soviets had provided through Libya. The Moroccan Air Force had been used to going nearly unchallenged against the Saharawis, but now nearly 10% of their air force had been 
been destroyed in one battle, and by January of the next year, the Saharawis had regained almost all of their claimed territory, although not their claimed capital, Layoun, around which the Moroccans had constructed a sand berm, complete with guard posts, trenches, and snipers. As the Cold War character of the conflict increased and both sides continued to build up their arsenals. By now, the Reagan administration was in control in America, and it much more liberally dispersed weapons to Morocco, including for offensive action, as the alignment of the Saharawis with the Soviets, Libyans, and Algerians pushed America further into Morocco's corner. As the arms buildup by both sides continued, the Saharawi position became unsustainable. The Royal Moroccan forces were getting the most modern technology and had access to American intelligence and advisors. Thus, over the next five years, they were able to capture almost all of the notable coastal cities, extending the berm and fortification structure from Layoun to extend around all of their captured territories. Meanwhile, the Saharawis still didn't have an air force, so their civilian population was again mostly in exile in Algeria, with only the the army remaining in the state itself. Over the next two years, Morocco continued to extend its control all the way to the southern portion of the territory, stopping just short of the Saharawi's strip to the ocean and the abandoned town of La Guerra. As the Moroccans came up again on Guelta Zemur, the second battle of Guelta Zemur broke out. Just as the first battle had been a decisive victory for the Saharawis, the second battle was an overwhelming victory for the Moroccans. 18 commandeered tanks and other vehicles being used by the Saharawis were destroyed by Moroccan planes and shells. A bulk of the Saharawi military equipment, as their caches of weapons snuck from Libya through Algeria to the Sahara, mainly consisted of arms and not armor. With Morocco capturing the outpost, the Saharawis were again confined just to the eastern stretches of Seguia El Hamra and Rio de Oro, with the exception of a narrow outlet to the sea and a narrow outlet to Algeria. The lack of air protection was still a major factor, and thus the civilian evacuations continued, again at this point numbering into the hundreds of thousands. However, by this point the Cold War was over, as the Soviet Union had given up its rivalry with America and was currently facing its own internal turmoil, and although support for the Saharawis via Algeria and Libya continued, this wasn't enough for America to continue sanctioning Morocco's war in the Sahara. But as the Americans pressured ceasefire talks, Morocco wanted to make sure that a ceasefire would be more like a victory, and so it launched the TIF Tiferidi campaign, bombing the urban centers of Seguia Alhamra that remained standing, which would render Tiferidi and other still intact Saharawi cities as useless, also reportedly dropping poison gas in water wells. The air raids were launched on August 4th of 1991, with the first night of raids taking one to three Saharawi casualties, but again the Saharawis taking much worse infrastructure damage, meaning that moving refugees back in would prove ever more impossible. The Tiferidi offensive continued on August 22nd with a ground assault, this time striking at the interim Saharawi capital, Bir Lelu. By the 25th, the Moroccans had seized the city, which had been hit by the airstrikes, and further destroying any useful infrastructure in the town. However, with a ceasefire soon coming into effect, the Moroccans began withdrawing their troops, as the ceasefire line was going to be restricted to just the sand berm itself. Morocco was not going to be allowed to extend the berm to include Bir Lelu. By September 6th, the Moroccans had withdrawn back inside their wall, and on that day the UN ceasefire finally came into effect, ending the Western Sahara War. Although no peace deal was signed, and the ceasefire essentially allowed Morocco to solidify its gains. Again, in part one I mentioned I'd explain how the Saharawi borders got to their weird shape. Well, that's how. These are still the current borders today, with most of the Saharawi population still living in Algeria as refugees, while for the most part, the remaining parts of the Saharawi state feature mainly military personnel and nomads. However, the outright fighting was finally at an end after a 15 plus year war. Four years later, the longtime Spanish enclaves, Ceuta and Melilla, the history of which I went into at the beginning of part one, were now separated from their respective Spanish autonomous regions, and they were fully upgraded to autonomous cities, becoming de facto autonomous regions of their own on March 14th, 1995. The Fuerzas Regulares Indigenas still maintains a presence in both cities, which are not just the last Spanish possessions on mainland Africa,
Africa, but the last European possessions on mainland Africa. Over the course of our video, the Canary Islands also became its own autonomous community, representing Spain's only other remaining possession in northwest Africa. In early 2008, the bomb-damaged cities of Tiferidi and Bir Lalu switched roles as Tiferidi became the temporary capital of the Republic, although again the Saharawis do claim Layoun, which is fully under Moroccan control and has been now for over 30 years as their true capital. This conflict remains essentially a frozen war, although Morocco does still claim Ceuta and Melilla, plus the remainder of the Saharawi territory, and even if the Saharawis in return claim the Morocco-occupied portions of the Sahara, including Layoun, whenever any of this will change again, nobody knows, following nearly 30 years of relative stability. But what is for sure is that the history of Morocco and the Sahara throughout the 20th century is not only fascinating, but also informs the genesis of the conflicts that exist in the area during the 21st century. So if you've been with us since part one, thank you for watching the whole thing. If you haven't been, then make sure to check out part one or our full Spanish Morocco playlist with both parts. And I'm glad you found the channel. Make sure to like, subscribe, share, and donate on Patreon. Thanks again for watching. I'm Alex. I'm out.